So, you know, we, we represent a lot of companies. Your fact pattern is not all that unique. And we are, are able to kind of tell you what's coming around the next corner that you don't see because we've done this many, many times and we are currently doing it many times. And so, you know, I, I think we all kind of represent companies throughout the life cycle, uh, largely because I don't think you can represent an early stage company unless you're a late stage lawyer too. Uh, you, you need to, you know, to, you're not a good lawyer if you have to hand it off at the Series B or Series C level. You need to be able to take a company and sell or bring public in order to, you know, actually tell you the company what to do at the Series A or Series B level. And I think that's kind of largely what we do. You know, I, I think we have value when we negotiate indemnity terms. We have value when we negotiate contracts for you. But the, the real value I think a good lawyer gives you, in our space at least, is that, you know, we can tell you not to make the business mistake you're about to make because we've had companies do it in the past. And that's probably kind of one of the tough things is that the value is all the scenarios, all the catastrophe scenarios that didn't happen that you have to avoid, right? And, uh, so, Amy, you, you've been part of a, so you're a lawyer, and you've also been general counsel of a public company. What kind of things have you seen that could have been really problematic uh, within the company, within the, the startup uh, that basically you, you kind of helped avoid or, or some of the stuff that you didn't see at the time or turned out to be problematic? Yep. Well, um, Jeremy uh, from the from Bessemer said earlier, when you're getting ready to get sold, hire a good lawyer. I, I actually disagree with that. I don't think you should wait until you're going to get sold to hire a good lawyer. You know, you need a good startup lawyer along the way because there's going to be decisions you make that are going to cost you 10 times or 100 times more to fix along the way. And if the buyer finds those problems while you're actually in the sale process, it's kind of too late. You've actually tarnished yourself. So, you know, uh, I fixed a lot of things. When I was uh, at Operative, the same company, we uh, everything I did, I thought about. Well, what is a buyer of this company going to think when they see this? So well, all of our customers, customers, so yes. all of our customer contracts were completely different. Every single one of our customers had different terms. Some of them could terminate if we got acquired. Some of them had indemnity clauses that had unlimited liability, and the buyer of the big software company so bought us. Change the ownership that would be the contract yes. would be terminated. Yeah, so we had a two million dollar contract with. With a uh, per year with NBC, if we get acquired, they can terminate the contract. Well, we were a recurring revenue business. We were a SaaS platform. The whole value of the business, the reason we got a high multiple, was because it's sticky revenue. And if the buyer can just walk, if the customer can walk away because we get sold, there is the value of our company just goes away. So that was our most valuable asset was who was our customer relationship, and it was in the contract, right? Our our, our revenue came from our contracts because it was committed revenue, and our business was based on a multiple of revenue. So if our revenue went away because this contract had blown up when we got acquired, that made a big difference. Um, all of our employee issues, so um, the, the granting of options, who owns what, understanding our cap table, understanding our liquidation preferences. We actually had we, the company existed for 10 years before I got there. We had a really messy cap table, Series A, Series B, Series C, Series D, Series A1. A2, A3, A1, A, A1, 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 A1B, A1C, and some of them were participating preferred. Some of them had sort of old East Coast dividends. And then in, in, I built a waterfall for it to understand, you know, if we're going to get sold, how much is everyone going to make? Because at the end of the day, you're trying to grow a business. You're trying to get sold. You know, the lawyers are trying to think about issues that are not legal issues. There's what's the deal? How much are people going to make? How much is, risk is the buyer going to take on? Um, is the business going to continue after you get sold? You're just trying to help people think through issues ahead of time. So that's all we're really, lawyers really do, is just guide people through, hey, I've been through this process. Think about what we're going to do now when we're going to get sold. Once we start the process, what are we going to do to get ready for the process? And then, of course, negotiating the deal. Um, but I think the much bigger value is fixing the problems or addressing the problems or having good discipline early so that you, everything's just on autopilot. You don't have to actually think about fixing it later. Think about it now. It's going to be a little bit more effort, but then things will be on autopilot. So the, the question is then, when do you start? Like, I think uh, somebody registered to this event sent me a message saying, oh, this is the only time I'll be able to afford to have like, so much lawyer time. Um, so how early can you engage as a, as a startup? Of course, you have like busy corporations or like some like, standard paperwork and people like seeds or something. Uh, but for all the other things, like how early can you have those conversations and like how much would that cost? Well, not not specifically for our, okay. just in the general yeah. idea, like is it worth spending early? I, 
I think I think a lot like like preventative medicine. The earlier start, the easier it is. And I think you know, I use you use the expression there. You got to fix it later, and, and that's often a much more difficult, painful process. And often doesn't doesn't actually you're not able to fix it in a way that achieves your initial goal. So I think the sooner you start with no goes into preventative medicine. Uh, that's true. Yeah, well, the, 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 the gym is one of the gym. Yeah. We exercise. We take right. vitamins. We eat healthy. Yeah, healthy. Yeah, exactly. It's, 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 it's actually all gym. pretty simple stuff that's right. when you think about it early. Yeah, and, and um, it's much more complicated than open heart surgery. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of my early stage clients, my like, really early stage clients that are like two guys in the garage, you know, I'm, I'm usually the first creditor uh, because, well, you know, Often, no, I mean, serious. Oftentimes, you know, if we, if we really believe in the founding team, you know, we'll give them a the peter roll and we'll defer it up to the, you know, first point of financing. Um, and so that way, you know, they they don't, you know, make any mistakes uh, right off the gate. And, um, you know, there's certain ways that, you know, startup lawyers uh, like us who also do later stage stuff um, can, you know, kind of give our expertise and, and um, you know, make it affordable for, for really, uh, truly startup companies. Uh, that said, you know, we, we have to meet the team and, and kind of kind of audition them uh, just like they're auditioning us because, again, we're, we're true partners with them at that, that, that family stage. Yep. Yeah, I mean, if you incorporate a company from the beginning, it's pretty simple. It's pretty easy. The relationship between the founders is going to be discussed early and it's all going to be documented early. If somebody says, well, you know what, I don't want to spend a few thousand dollars on Ben Murphy Goodwin. I'll spend a few hundred dollars on my brother-in-law. It's going to cost... Twenty-five thousand dollars to fix that six months, a year from late now. And there may be huge tax problems because you actually issue the shares right. You didn't file your eighty-three B elections. You can't get QSBS treatment, tax treatment, which means that you can actually have tax-free uh, when you sell your shares. If you hold them for five years, you can actually uh, don't have to pay taxes on your income. So all those kinds of things could be worth millions and millions of dollars, and you save yourself a few hundred dollars if you didn't go to Goodwin or to Fenway, who. Will, write, will say, like you said, they, they won't charge you anything, or they'll charge you, but they won't collect, so you raise money. Um, they'll come to your board meetings, and you have someone that's done hundreds of deals sitting in your boardroom, and you just bounce ideas off of them, and they're usually free when they're sitting in your boardroom. So it's it's never too early to go to a startup lawyer, because startup lawyers represent startups. That's all they do, and they know that startups don't have a lot of money, and we built a business on encouraging them to grow because when you guys are successful we're successful that's what's important to us so since the topic is around exits um, we're, we're, we're going to cover like a whole uh, speed for the M&A's but also uh, a bit of ideas if you guys have also some experience in that uh, what are the typical sticky points you see um, with uh, <coughs> exits on, on your role in, in that yeah I think you know uh, somebody asked about kind of key term sheet points to think about so so the term sheet, I think, is pretty important when you're on the sell side, because it's your opportunity to really set a number of the terms, both financial and legal, before you kind of get paid to the deal. I think for a founder, it gets difficult. You, you tend to lose leverage the longer you go on, and the closer you are to actually signing. You're like, well, maybe I can give on that or that point, because you know, you're know you seeing the check about to be written. So, so, so you can do that, a lot of that up front. And, and what we like to think about is what money you're getting, how much is, are you getting up front, and what is subject to you know a, a hold back or an earn out? And then what is what is the allocation of risk? A lot of what the merger document is is, is simply an allocation of risk, you know, between the buyer and the seller. The seller, you know about the company, so you tell you know you the buyer asks you to make a number of reps and warranties, a number of statements like tell me what about the company. You know about it, disclose as much as you can, and then if you violate that those representation warranties, you should make me whole. And so we spend a lot of time talking about the indemnities right up front, because that, that's also money that could leave your pocket as a founder or you know, your investor's pocket. So we, we try to get as detailed up front as you can. What, what do you mean by indemnities? So an indemnity is essentially a, a contractual protection where I, the <coughs> seller, will say to, to, to the buyer, if, if, some, if I made a misstatement in any of these you know, number of things, from how many shares were outstanding to the number of material contracts we have, um, to you know, environmental issues, to IP issues, that we will make you whole for any damage you may suffer. So there's like some amount in escrow cover that, right? So, so often there, there's an escrow amount to cover that. You think about caps uh, for the different types of damages. You may set different types of caps right? depending on kind of fundamental risks, things that are fundamental to, to what they're buying versus just ordinary business risk. And so you want to think about that all up front because that's when you, as a seller, um, are going to have the most leverage because it gets much harder to do. 
yeah, the part of the line. And in the core dev session this morning, the, uh, the, the speaker uh, talked about the, the, also the legal risk that was a small company get by the bigger company. The bigger company is much easier to also, also target. And there's also a stability there. Uh, have you seen also those situations arise of the big escrow amounts being like, set aside potential lawsuits or anything like that? Or maybe, or maybe like some potential risk that we make the deal for the yeah, there's certainly there's always a, a risk in terms of it just goes back again to risk shifting between the buyer and the seller, and that just becomes a contractual kind of agreement about how much risk does the buyer want to take on versus the seller. There's kind of set industry standards for you know for, for general caps in terms of reps, uh, in terms of uh, the indemnity and how much of the purchase price. But those are those are not necessarily you know those are kind of industry norms, but they're not set in stone, and everything depends on the business. And so there's also a special indemnities where if a, find, if a buyer finds something out, they might say, look, everything else would be subject to this cap, but I want a separate cap for a matter because we find out there is this, this employment dispute, and we don't think that should be on our burden. So we want that outside the cap. So again, I think Eli was saying, you know, early on, if you have all of that in order, you kind of protect yourself, you know, down, you know, down the line of the entire sale process. If you guys have some like specific examples, like you know, these names of like company A or like whatever, I don't really want to talk about it, to, to just like get a clear idea of what could be the impact of something that goes wrong. Because when everything's right, there's you know, we're nothing to say, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, to answer your, your first question, uh, the sticking points in an m and I think, you know, certainly the, these terms that were negotiated in M&A are, are, are hugely important, but you know, even before you get to the terms, you know, I, I see, you know, companies fail, fail to sell when there's often, you know, huge cost uh, basis disparities between the later stages of preferred stock. And I think we're going to see more and more of this coming soon with the kind of overblown tech valuations that we're all seeing. Um, you know, off, always there's going to be a, a huge price disparity between like a Series A security and a Series E security. But, you know, as these companies scale and then get soft bank style valuations, um, they become essentially kind of, very, very uh, unsaleable in a lot of different circumstances. Um, there's going to be mixed motivations at the board level and across the investor base. And I think um, I've seen it recently in the last six months, three companies uh, enter sale process, and um, they could not achieve an M&A valuation uh, that approached the kind of late stage uh, valuation that, you know, these investors put on the company. And, you know, for internal fund reasons, they didn't want to take a 0.8x. And they didn't really want to take a 1.2x either. And so the company just had to continue running when, you know, that's probably a suboptimal outcome. <laughs> so I think, um, you know, for founders here, which there are a lot of as your company grows, you know, I think it's going to be really attractive to say, yes, I want that $150 million valuation. I want that billion dollar valuation on my Series E when, you know, kind of you and everyone around the table is kind of knows that's, that's a bit divorced from reality. Uh, I think, um, taking a more kind of realistic valuation, one that could be mirrored in an M&A exit, might actually be, be better, although, you know, you're, you're giving up some dilution there. So that's kind of what came up with some three sessions, well, should I be like, versus valuation? So valuation feels great, but it's fine, but closing out of the holes. Yeah, and, and, and some of these later stage investors, you know, especially when they're doing a crossover round, um, you know, they, they're very comfortable putting a billion dollar valuation on the company, even though if they're honest with themselves, it might be a six hundred million dollar valuation because they've got a ratchet protection on an IPO and a, and a senior preferred security. Going back to our, our previous panel, so what we were talking about is not terms, it's valuation. Fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're going to they're going to do fine, but you know they, they have kind of an ultimate uh, kind of block, uh, and so you know I, I'm, I'm I see that I've seen that in the last six months paralyze companies and really kind of make them almost unsaleable at any kind of realistic valuation. So one other topic we, we mentioned uh, earlier was, so a lot of companies that keep doing a fundraising for fundraising and they're hoping maybe for the next one that you exit. Um, have, have you worked with companies that are doing like double tracks or triple tracks, um, means PC versus m and versus IPO all at the same time, or you don't maybe other exotic, exotic options or which one? So I, I see the IP I, I see the IPO and MA dual track a lot. I, I often don't see um, a BC private company financing coupled with a tra with an MA track coupled with an IPO track. I, I see that MA and, and IPO. Um, you know, oftentimes before you know you can make confidential filings with your S ones. 
um, on, in, in the IPO process, you file an S-1, which is a registration statement pursuant to which you issue your shares on public markets. And years ago, you had to actually make your first S-1 filing public. Now you can c confidentially submit up until you print reds and go on the road and, and sell your securities. But that often kicked off an M&A track because as soon as you put publish your S-1, all of a sudden people that like, came out of the woodwork to kind of see if they could give you a preemptive offer before you price the company and go public. So I think the IPO and M&A kind of always go hand in hand. Uh, so I think it's always, even if you don't hire a banker and run each process individually, um, you're going to have a, uh, you, you're going to almost like, it, it's going to come together and you're going to have M&A and IPO options if you're running an IPO track, please. Yeah, and it's usually, you, it's a much longer process to run the IPO. So it's usually you're gearing up for an IPO and you run the dual track, the m &A. It's not that it rarely goes the other way around. Yeah, right? I think you're getting sold. And, oh, by the way, maybe we just undecide to go through uh, an IPO process. Yeah, and, and what I've seen, too, is if you do want to run, like, a real process, uh, IPO and m and um, I think everyone knows that you, used to, you hire certain kind of bulge bracket banks to underwrite your IPO. They're not necessarily the best at selling tech companies. And there's some, you know, very good uh, uh, investment bankers that sell tech companies, Catalyst, Centerview, and, and the like, that don't necessarily put their names on the cover of an IPO book. Um, and so, you know, th and this is important um, when you when you are, and maybe no one know you're at the stage now, but when you are negotiating an engagement with three bankers, you, you can do uh, two different bankers. So you can have J.P. Morgan take you on, on, the, on the road publicly, but also, you know, sign a separate engagement letter to do the M&A process with another kind of boutique tech seller. Yeah. Uh, earlier, when we talked with bankers, um, so they mentioned about their role uh, by finding different buyers and the negotiating on the behalf so that you can support the relationship with a future employer. Um, but they also mentioned that earlier, they tried to nurture the relationship with founders uh, by bringing them business, uh, giving awareness uh, to their larger corporate clients about startups. Um, is that also something that, that you guys do as lawyers? Like, um, because you have a lot of corporate relationships and you probably see a lot of startups as well. So what other kind of value add aside from you know, dealing with the nitty gritty of contracts and IP and all that stuff, do uh, you bring also to, to startups? I mean, I, I think certainly just because we're all in the market so much, you know, we, we certainly kind of know uh, Squeal represents, you know, 50% of his practices representing kind of investors and the other 50 is representing companies. Um, obviously, it's a pretty attractive thing to get a company client when, when they know that you're, you know, talking to investors too, uh, because you can put them all in the same room. And I, I think we all probably do that to, to a large extent. Um, it always it is very helpful and kind of it, it helps us too because that means the clients are getting funded. Yeah, I think it's more though on the funding side, right? So we invest, we, we, will introduce our investor clients to our startup clients, or our startup clients to our the investors that we know, or to the corporate venture arms that we know, you know, Merck or Comcast uh, <coughs> investment arms. We rarely invest, introduce our startup clients to the buyers. I mean, we, for example, represent Cisco and Facebook on all their M&A. We, we're not really introducing our startups to Facebook. That would be a concept, right? I mean, it's just a little awkward. You know, they can't get sold because they don't, they, they're big enough now. Okay, you they need to bring on somebody's The startup you're working with can also work on the deal for the acquisition? Well, it depends on which outside. You, know, you, can't work, you can't work on both. You okay. need a waiver. Um, <laughs> and for, yeah. we're, we, we would never represent someone getting sold to Facebook or Cisco, but there are some other companies that we represent. We do 30 or 40% of their deals, and we might represent the, uh, the, the tech company and say, hey, we're, you know, we're not representing you on this buy side deal. We're going to represent the tech, the tech company. Can you waive a conflict? And almost always they waive the conflict. One deal actually just recently last year, the client didn't waive the conflict, so we fired that client and won't represent them again. Oh. Any comments on that? Yeah, no, I, I think what they said is right. I think, you know, we we, we also make introductions often not on the commercialization side. So certainly we do a lot of life sciences work here at Goodwin, and so will often uh, make introductions between our early stage life science companies with kind of large pharma companies, um, largely for kind of licensing deals, which often lead to these, these MA type outcomes. So it sounds like founders don't realize that they should be spending more time to do that as well as bankers as well, much earlier than they think. Because you might be getting business or ideas or they're picking up a lot of things that might cost a lot of data. Yes. <laughs> Agreed. Sorry, so it sounds like so the bankers give a really good deal because they don't charge you for it. But you 
guys chunk by the hour, right? You know, all those conversations. It really depends on how much we like the client. You know, it, like, it's, a lot of my clients are my friends too. And, um, you know, if we're grabbing a beer or something, that's that's not on the clock. Um, you know, certainly, if, certainly if we're negotiating a merger agreement, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's legal work. Not the, the clock is yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah, Introductions, yeah. going through business plans, we, we don't charge for that. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're doing your series seed or your commercial note, you, you've never done a business plan before, we're going to look at it. We're not going to charge it. No. Um, another important question that uh, um, we, we got some elements of, of, of comments you know, in the previous session, but it's kind of difficult to get it because kind of, you know, you, know, you, 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 you ask all them, how can you get the most money out of an acquisition? They don't really want to tell you, right? Um, so, in, in your case as lawyers, it sounds like you're not like, really in a, that much, um, I mean, you're definitely involved in the acquisition small team, for example. Uh, where, well, you have the banker, the lawyer, the accountant, uh, and uh, on the probably CEO uh, on the sales side. What can you do to help uh, in the negotiation process uh, to create a better market for the deal, or to, um, to more generally to optimize the outcome? Also. Yeah, I, so I think it's a, it's a couple of things. I think we like to think about it. Um, one, if we've done our job right and we've helped other company, and you kind of follow it on good governance, then you're in a much better place than when, when the buyer is looking at you, you don't get sidetracked with a bunch of, of errors that you now need to fix. I think that that's one thing, because then they see that there's, there's, there's that value is done. I think, too, we also think about it, because earnouts are such a big part of these M&A transactions, so that means that you know, you'll get some cash up front or some cash in stock, whatever the consideration is, but some of it will be held back for, for achieving certain milestones. And I think we really try to help our founders think about that, looking at, if you've got multiple bidders, looking at term sheets, so sometimes the best price is not always is not always the best deal for the founders because they're not getting everything as much up front or the earnout uh, so requirements are exact. All those terms of earnout requirements might be too high that they might not actually be able to, to meet those targets. So we try to be able to know the session that earnouts would be never, almost never work. Yeah. 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 That, that's exactly. the advice we get. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think, um, I, I think you know, in my experience, lawyers don't necessarily negotiate, you know, kind of the upfront purchase price that's typically the business folks, and if there's a banker involved, the banker does that. Um, but you know what we're really good at is kind of making sure that the purchase price that they expect is the purchase price that they get, and so there's not any kind of post-closing kind of leakage of purchase well, price back to the buyer. Yeah. So you know, and what Leo was saying, you know, uh, a good merger agreement with um, kind of tight reps that are bounded uh, can kind of preserve that purchase price that you're taking home uh, on the day of closing. Um, so you don't have to give it back to the buyer and do, you know, breach of representation or warranty or covenant or, you know, kind of leakage in the working capital adjuster. It's not like it's a little bit of a kind of thankless job. Like, you do all that this work to avoid trouble, um, when things are normal and fine, people don't even barely realize what you've done, right? Yeah, but but no, you found the inside because you were, you were general counsel and you, you have a bit more of a thank you at the end. Well, I mean, in, in some respects that's partially true, right? I mean, the, the smartest lawyers I know are the business people who actually think about legal issues, right? Because there, there is no difference between a legal issue and a business issue in my mind. It's just, we're just here to guide you in thinking of the issues that really matter. And those issues, when you think about them, actually are business issues. I mean, it's, you know, if do I have to give some of this money back if something goes wrong? Is that a legal issue? No, you care. So if, if you someone's gonna pay you $100, you want to be able to get that hundred dollars and keep that hundred dollars. So you don't want to, in the process of negotiation, that the buyer finds something and says, "Wait a minute, what's this problem?" That's really a five dollar problem. I'm going to only give you ninety five, so I'm going to lower the price. You don't want that. Bad. You don't want them to find something that says, "You know what? I'm not going to buy you. You guys are a mess. I found two cockroaches. That means there's probably another ten in the wall. I don't want to. I'm not going to even bother looking, right? So you want to make so the lawyers help you sort of get organized." Make no mistakes along the way. It helps you package your your sale process, right? You want to be organized in the way your data room is set up. So all the information that the buyer wants to look at needs to be pristine, organized. If everything looks organized and Goodwin and Fenwick put it away, put it uh, put it together, like you know what this it looks about right. If they find something that disor disorganized, they're like you know I have to read this. If I have to read it, I mean I, I got to find something. And if they find something, they're going to definitely ask for a purchase price adjustment. Right. There also, you know, you also need to make sure that what's in your data room is part of your story. 
right? So you're talking about what's good about your business and what's bad about your business. You're actually talking about the things that are bad about your business. Don't let them find it. Your, your story about your business needs to line up with your financial model. Your financial model needs to sign up, line up with your debt, right? So it's all about just thinking about all the different pieces and all the story parts that go together and are, are organized. And they're at the end of the day, they're going to say, okay, we, we went through this whole process. Here's your hundred dollars, and uh, the contract is negotiated in such a way that it's really hard for them to get some of that money back. That's really what we do. So it's also a transparency and trust. You know. Yeah, and a lot of it's building trust, right? You're you're selling to somebody. I mean, the one the VC said it before. You know, you're selling to someone who you're going to, who's going to buy you, who you're going to work for later. Right? You you so you don't want to get in those fights. You want to actually make sure that those fights don't exist beforehand. So if you can make sure those fights don't exist. And if those fights do have to happen, let the lawyers do their job. You know, don't be a hero. The CEO should have a playbook. In the same way the buyers have a playbook. And they're going to go through that. And there's no way to really shortcut that. They're going to go through their process. And it's going to be long and it's going to be hard. Don't go out for drinks with, this, with the, the private equity guy or the buyer and think you're going to negotiate something in there and come back and the deal is done. That, that's a trap. They're going to totally get you on that. You're going to agree to something over and then you're going to give something, but it's not going to be a give get. And you, you actually didn't have a plan for it. The lawyers help you think about, hey, look, these are the 10 issues that are going to come up. Before the term sheet ever came up, you know, what's your value? And what do you want to get when you sell the company? Think about those as part of the terms of the, of the sale. And then you actually have, you're prepared to negotiate the term sheet. Yeah, I mean, in, in your example, if you're, if you're a founder CEO selling your company to a private equity guy, uh, you know, there, there's a built-in asymmetry of information there because you might have done this twice in your life, maybe two times if you're lucky, but he does this every day. And so uh, you certainly will be giving away something uh, that you don't know you are. Yeah, that's kind of interesting you mentioned private equity because uh, that, that's something we kind of realized also as we were doing those, those workshops in different cities. That those guys are also not invited to the events and they now do a, a large number of acquisitions. So I, I'm off of the tech acquisition. So I, 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 like seven years ago, I never saw them in a process. Every single company that I sold to was too strategic, uh, almost without exception. Now in every single process I do, not even with you know tech companies that are not even to driven, um, there's private equity buyers and and they're, they're competitive and they're um, you know willing to do evaluation pro forma based on kind of what they expect to do to the company after closing. So their valuations actually keep up with strategic valuations, which is incredibly helpful on the sell side, honestly, because we're getting much, much better sell side terms. You know, if you look at kind of the, uh, the evolution of like the average escrow size over the last three years, it's dropped considerably because private equity guys will go into uh, a deal with.